everyone, and welcome into another episode of Investing in Real Estate. I'm Clayton Morris. Thank you so much for bringing us back once again into your homes, in your car, you're taking a walk, you're exercising, whatever you're doing. I hear from so many of you who listen to a couple episodes at a time while you're on your commute every day and wanting to build passive income for your life. This podcast is totally devoted to building passive income, legacy wealth for your family. We talk about buy and hold real estate on this show. And we've had some great episodes in the past where we talk about finding your freedom number. I would encourage you to go back and check out those episodes where we walk you through step by step by step how to find your freedom number. It's based on a simple formula that I discovered a few years ago. It's how I've managed to build financial freedom in my family, um, how many houses it would take for you uh, based on your monthly expenses to find financial freedom. So go back and check out that episode. But today we are going to be focused solely on the idea of the three stages of real estate investing. Now, I know many of you probably have you know, I've, I've spoken to many of you on the phone, quite honestly, and I bring this up occasionally, depending on your age, that there are three stages of real estate investing. Um, it really comes from Gary Keller's model of the million, the, you know, the millionaire real estate investor. Uh, this is the model that, that we use in my family. Uh, it's a model that I had to remind my wife of when we started investing a number of years ago, that cash flow at this stage is not terribly, is not terribly important. Now, I know that sounds counterintuitive to what we're talking about here on the show, but it really is at this stage. So if you find yourself in your 20s or 30s or 40s, frankly, even your 50s, I just want to say it takes very few years to accumulate a portfolio of properties. I mean, you can do this in as little as three years, four years, five years. You don't need 30 years uh, of real estate investing to acquire a lot of properties. It can happen very, very quickly. Just ask some of our investors who started with zero properties with us and now own 12, 15, 16 properties. It happens very, very fast. So there are three stages of real estate investing. I'm going to tell you what those are, and then I'll dive into each of them. They are buy, own, and cash flow. Number one is buy. Number two is own. And number three is cash flow. To some of you, this might be old school. This might be rudimentary, and you might scoff at this and say, I already knew this. For a lot of you, this might be a new way of thinking. Uh, but for those old schoolers out there, I want this might help reframe some things for you a little bit. I think the natural tendency is to think that everything's got a cash flow 100% when we buy it, right? That everything is going to bring in, uh, that that cash flow from that tenant is what it's all about. Of course, it is, in the end, what it's all about. But quite honestly, in the beginning, what it's all about is building net worth. So the people who are truly wealthy, truly rich, yes, the cash flow is icing on the cake, but they've built their net worth. So on paper, on a spreadsheet, they've added five, six, eight, nine, ten 10 properties to their net worth. Now they are worth a million dollars or $750,000 because of the assets that they have purchased. Not because of the cash flow, which again, we'll get to later, but because of the assets themselves. So let's go into each one of these. Number one, buy. So if we're using Gary Keller in his amazing book, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, as a methodology for this, right? His argument is, to get to a million dollars in net worth. So his argument is buy a million. So how do we buy a million? Well, there are a number of ways to buy a million. You've heard that some of them here on this very podcast where we talk about leveraging private, private money. For instance, our episode with Jeff House, I would encourage you to go back and listen to Jeff's interview. You know, you don't need to have a great credit score. You frankly don't even need to have... Um, anything, any money down. If you know what you want, build your one sheet, build your criteria of what you'd like to buy and find private money because there's so much private money out there. So let's say you find 20 properties that you would like to buy. You, you know, maybe you're buying them for 50,000. Uh, you're putting that money together. Um, and you are now moving into the buying a million phase. So the goal is identify the properties you'd like to buy, 
and then buy a million dollars in net worth value of those properties. Um, and again, so let's just do the back of the book envelope here, uh, calculations. So let's say we have um, 20 properties and they're each, you're buying them for 50,000. That's $1 million of net worth. Okay. Now you're saying to yourself, yeah, but how am I going to do that? I don't, you know, I'm going to have leverage on all these properties and I'm not actually going to be able to see the cash flow from these and I'm going to have to be paying somebody back. Yeah, probably. Let me give an example of an investor friend of mine who bought, I think a hundred properties in the Midwest. I think he bought them in somewhere in Ohio. This was about five years ago. No, maybe six years ago now, uh, right after the crash happened, he bought a whole slew of properties um, about a hundred of them. And he bought them with leverage. He bought them with private money. And I think he put five year notes on these properties. Okay. With a private lender. And I forget what exact percentage rate he found. Maybe it was seven, eight percent or something like that. So the monthly rent that he was bringing in from these properties cash flowed a little bit above what he owed this private lender. A little bit. And the rule of thumb is if it cash flows $1 over all of your leverage point on this property, then that's fine. So if you want to take out your 40% for vacancy repairs and expenses, and then of course you're paying this private lender back. So let's just say hypothetically, I want to throw some numbers out here. Hypothetically, your your monthly cash flow would be $700 on a property, okay? $700. And let's say your private note with an individual is $350, right? So 700, let's take out property management right off the bat. So let's figure 10% for that. So 700 minus um, $70, that gives you 630. Now 630 is what you have left. Then you want to put aside your uh, your money for, uh, you want to put aside that 40% for vacancy repairs and expenses. You want to take that out of your equation. So 630 times 0. 0.6. So you have $378 left. Well, let's say your private note is $350 or $300 roughly. So you're left with maybe $28 or maybe $78 at the end of the month, every month for five years. That's not very much cash flow, but that's the point. We're not in the cash flow phase yet. Your renter is paying all of your note and everything else on top of that it's just a little bit of icing on the cake for five years. Stay with me. Stay with me here, okay? So let's go back to that 20 property formula. You bought 20 properties for a million and they're worth a million dollars. You bought it with private money on a five-year note at, I don't know, 8% interest, okay? And you're, you're bringing in like just a few dollars over your leverage point. You've bought a million. Now the next phase is you own a million. So after five years, now you own them free and clear. You've used the rental payment. You've used the rent from the tenant to pay back this private lender. And now you own these properties free and clear. Now you own them in the second phase. And the third phase is that it cash flows. Now these properties are cash flowing. So like my like my friend who owned, uh, you know, who bought over a hundred properties in the Ohio area, I think near Cleveland during the crash, he did, he was only bringing in like a few dollars every month after he'd pay the note back. And after he just set aside money for expenses and things like that, but he used almost the entire rent payment to pay the principal balance back. And after five years, these properties just started popping free and clear, free and clear. Now what's 20 properties that are cash flowing $700 a month? right? What is that? That's $14,000 a month times 12. That's $168,000 a year in cash flow. That's now yours, but you've added to your overall net worth of $1 million. So these are the three stages of real estate investing. It's very easy to think in reverse. It's very easy to think cash flow first. So often I'll talk to investors in their mid thirties and I'll say, you know, their concern is really the cash flow after they're, you know, maybe they're going to be cash flowing $300 every month above, you know, they're paying a private lender back or they've got a home equity line of credit that they're using, or they're using some other form of leverage. And I have to remind folks that no, 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 no. You're in your mid thirties. No, what you should be concerned about is adding to your net worth on paper. Now you and your family are worth 
500,000, 600,000. Add another property, 650,000. Add another property, 700,000. And you're cash flowing a little bit. Great. You're still working. You're still, you still got your nine to five job for a few years. And then after a few short years of doing this diligently, those properties start popping free and clear and the cash flow starts rolling in. That's the power of passive income. That's the power of this strategy, the three stages of real estate investing. Now, I've talked to investors who are in their 50s or 60s. And again, it takes a few short years to build up this portfolio of properties. So we want to maybe accelerate that plan a little bit. So any money you have left over at the end of the month should just go right back to the principal balance. You shouldn't be you know, going out to dinners or anything like that. So if you've got $78 left over after all of your leverage and you set aside money, that should just go right towards the principal balance with your private investor uh, or your home equity line of pay, you know, uh, home equity line of credit payback, whatever it is, just get it down fast if you're into that, you know, in your 50s or 60s, which is nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, you're you're getting started. It's better late than never. Um, I have investors that just started with us that's in in you know in, in their 60s, which is great. Good for them. They're starting. They're able to build legacy wealth. That's what it's all about and hand it down to their family. If you have any questions about this, please reach out to us. I'd love to talk to investors. And if you haven't downloaded our Freedom Cheat Sheet, it's so simple. Just go to Morris Invest. That's M-O-R-R-I-S Invest.com slash freedom. Morris Invest.com slash freedom. You can download our free cheat sheet. And if you haven't downloaded it yet, just walk through. It's about three pages long. It's a simple PDF. It'll show you the number of properties you need to achieve financial freedom. Thank you so much, everyone, for your kind feedback on this show. We publish this show three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. We try to bring you a lot of value, a lot of great experts. We have some fantastic guests coming up here on the show. And please go back and check some of our great shows in the past because we've had some, we've talked private money. We talked with uh, uh, Tom Wheelwright, talked about tax-free wealth and how to really structure your business properly, your LLC, and how to take advantage of all the tax benefits of real estate. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time on another episode of Investing in Real Estate. I'm Clayton Morris. Much love to all of you, and thank you so much for your time.